Chirac, and uh, this is a great interview. Uh, I'm here in uh, Los Angeles, the city uh, named after angels that, uh, of course, we know do not exist. And uh, so Ted Chirac is a person uh, that is recognized as the uh, founder of the Second Gun Theory and uh, the foremost journalistic authority on the uh, Senator Robert Kennedy assassination. And... Uh, co-producer of the Golden Globe-nominated film, The Second Gun. And uh, here is a Harper's Magazine. This, is, uh, this magazine is as old as Abraham Lincoln. And uh, they have uh, on the cover, Who Shot Robert Kennedy? And uh, there's a nice quote in here about uh, Ted Chirac. And it says, uh, much of this uh, questioning about the... Uh, the theory that Sirhan Sirhan was the person that killed Robert Kennedy uh, was stimulated by The Second Gun, a film made by uh, Theodore Chirac in 1970. This film, shown around New York in late 1972 and 1973, tilted the whole RFK assassination industry in an entirely new direction. And so I'm, I'm happy to be talking with you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be chatting with you, uh, Ted Chirac. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in, uh, Ted was uh, in the actual Ambassador Hotel the night that Robert Kennedy was killed. He was there um, seconds before. He was just outside of the uh, the kitchen, and uh, so he has an extensive uh, investigation on the killing of Robert Kennedy, and is, as I said, the foremost authority. And so let's just go immediately into the uh, Robert Kennedy killing. I'd like to just start with that, um, and that was on uh, June 5th, 1968. What is amazing to me now is that here we are in 2003, and, uh, you know, 35 years later, and people have not figured this thing out. So they still think that Sirhan Sirhan is responsible for killing uh, Robert Kennedy. And so let's just go through... Uh, um, Robert, Robert Kennedy wins the Demo Democratic nomination for the president of the USA that night. And uh, so, I, I, I mean, I, I can't understand why there were no cameras, no video of the killing, no hidden surveillance cameras in the Ambassador Hotel, such a hot political spot. I mean, and now, of course, it's in the news and it may become a national landmark or it may be uh, destroyed. Um, and so... I, I kind of wonder, why were there no cameras there filming? I mean, there were cameras outside, but why not cameras following Robert Kennedy? I mean, such an important person. There must have been more video than being reached or shown to the public. You know? Well, there was film, and a great deal of filming going on. There were news cameras domestically, that's it, from the United States, and internationally. And they were shooting uh, Bobby Kennedy, during the victory speech in the embassy ballroom where people were cheering Bobby Kennedy all the way with Bobby, 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 and he was in triumph. He won the South Dakota primary and the Southern California and California primary, and uh, he beat Eugene McCarthy. He had lost in Oregon. So there were still photographers and film crews, but as it happened in the moment of crucial and history and of historical dimension, at the exact time Sir Hans stepped out and fired Bobby Kennedy, uh, the only camera that was rolling that the world doesn't know about was Willis Lapnix. And he had a sound man, and he got frightened when the bullets began, uh, you heard the rattle, dazzle, like firecrackers, <laughs> and the enormous uh, chaos and the screaming and the shouting. Uh, he, he dropped his camera, the sound man uh, dropped microphone lights, but they did get actuality sound. Uh, 
And you Boris were... Yaro of Los Angeles Times was looking in his viewfinder just as Kennedy passed. But no one caught the actual shooting except one young photographer, Scott Engard. And uh, that's and just uh, the hands of fate played a part. He was going to the kitchen pantry, so he had reached the press room where there would be uh, voluminous Camera and microphone. Uh, microphone. What do you think of the possibility of uh, hidden wiretap or hidden microphones, hidden cameras that uh, might be in government archives somewhere, uh, not available to the public? Do you think that's a possibility? Or I don't think so. Media yeah. in 1968. In 1968. Uh, they didn't expect you to go to the kitchen pantry. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that was a last moment decision. Mm -hmm. He was to go downstairs to the ambassador ballroom, but he received uh, orders to go. To a press conference in the glowing room instead of going downstairs uh, to turn eastward and go towards the kitchen pantry into the colonial room. And uh, these were instructions to the maitre d', Carl Uecker, Okay. who was pulling him along. Okay, so what what were you doing there uh, no. at, at the Ambassador Hotel? I mean, that's pretty uh, amazing timing that you were there at such a uh, pivotal moment in history when Robert Kennedy was almost guaranteed to be uh, the Democratic nominee going against Richard Nixon into the, for the President of the USA and probably by all probability would, uh, like JFK, would have won against Nixon. Uh, so here you were next to the person that was going to be the next President of the USA, a very smart, uh, sensitive uh, person. And what, what, what were you doing there? And well, I was uh, with the press corps. I was a member of the media and I was uh, an independent broadcaster of them. Telecoming Communications News and Continental Broadcast News, which was a syndicated a news uh, bureau uh, directed by Jeff Brent. And uh, we were working together covering the event. And I was outside the kitchen in Candy Door interviewing Bobby Kennedy's brother in law, Stephen Smith, who served as Bobby Kennedy's campaign manager. And so when the shots rang out, Steve Smith and I heard them. I stopped the interview and I told Stephen Smith to go to the podium and calm the crowd down. He hadn't entered the kitchen pantry, so he hadn't seen uh, Bobby on the kitchen floor. And of course, he said everybody clear the room, which was a mistake of their lobby and securing the room. And so I was the first witness to reach the kitchen pantry door and enter the scene of confusion, chaos, and calamity. Mm -hmm. So there really is no Zabruder film for the RFK uh, committee that clearly shows what happened. Well, the uh, one film there is was the Scott Enyard film. But surprisingly, he was followed by six uh, plain clothes men and uniformed men chasing him to get his camera, retrieve his camera and his film, and it was snapped from him. And that's how he got right. his camera back, but not all the film was there, and he fought for 20 years until he had to sue the Los Angeles Police Department in the city of Los Angeles for his own uh, negatives. And he won? He won a very difficult loss, and I was his principal witness. The Scott Engler trial, Engler versus Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Police Department, and he went on trial. That's a story in itself. Uh, yeah, I think this shows just exactly that the people in the Los Angeles police and the parts of the U.S. government that are supposed to be doing stopping violence and security have some severe problems, and perhaps maybe because they're not democratic and they're not policed themselves by the public, and uh, we'll get into that later. But I want to go into a little bit more about the two people that are involved with the shooting. Sirhan Sirhan appears to me, and I'm really a, a novice at this, uh, this, this uh, Ted knows much, much more than I do, but my opinions are that he was a religious, zealot, extremist, extremist, anti-Jewish. Uh, I'm not sure if he was Christian, uh, not Islamic, but he clearly was an Arab person. He was an Arabic extraction. Mm -hmm. He was a Christian was a Arab. Christian. Uh, most decidedly, and he was very anti-Zionistic and anti-Jewish. And uh, for revisionists to try to change that today uh, is hopelessly wrong and does a disservice.
service and the truth that they are speaking. He really was a typical religious, you know, average and religious. He was very religious. He was involved in the politics of the Middle East, where he came from, Israel and Palestine. And I think he was born in Jerusalem, which was part of Jordan at the time. And he saw the first uh, war of independence uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, the Arabs, in 1948. He witnessed that and saw the brutality and the shocking trauma of the times. Uh, and he was involved in Middle East politics, very partial to the Palestinian cause. Yes. This, uh, the religious violence on the planet Earth is, is just idiotic, in my opinion. And uh, being atheist, uh, why do people believe in gods and devils? I, I, and the reason I think is because they're missing basic history and evolution, I think, and also not getting an opportunity to have sex, regular, healthy, natural sex. I, I don't know. So let's talk a little bit about Gene Caesar, the person that you claim I think is obvious is the person that killed RFK by firing three times in the back of RFK. Uh, so Gene Caesar, on the other hand, appears like is he, a ca he is a Caucasian male. Uh, he is uh, uneducated, of course, a male human. He is a conservative racist. He supported George Wallace, uh, I mean a notorious racist. Uh, he's connected to the Lockheed uh, company. He was employed at, at Lockheed and also worked for Ace Security. And so he seems like he's coming a person that, in my no novice opinion, that he was connected to people with big money and high technology. He called the Kennedys, uh, he's quoted as calling the Kennedys, thinking the Kennedys are crooks. And uh, he, he also said that he, when the firing happened, he ducked and covered, perhaps a reference to the old 60s film of what to do during a nuclear war or something, thinking, perhaps hinting that he did the planet a favor by killing RFK uh, because of the potential nuclear uh, war that may have happened. That was kind of, that's just well, you have to be careful what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, he allegedly uh, fired his gun because he has never been named officially as a suspect or indicted. So we say that Spain Eugene Caesar is the alleged second gunman. Well, clearly the Thomas Noguchi autopsy says everything to me. I mean, there was three close-range uh, shots fired into Kennedy, powder burns. I mean, it had to be within an inch from Kennedy's body. Kennedy grabbed Gene Caesar uh, by the throat and pulled off the uh, clip on necktie. I think the thing is not too difficult to figure out. But uh, And I think it was a, it's a tragedy that this is being covered up. And it's, it's as I say, 35 years later. So... So he didn't grab Kennedy's necktie. That's an erroneous information that comes from the Christian uh, Turner book, particularly uh, a pseudo investigator, John Christian. Uh, his bow tie fell off at the time he dropped to the kitchen floor. Uh, I interviewed Caesar, and he was not aware at the time what I was searching for to get all the information and the true facts, and it slipped out. Uh, he was certainly in that firing position. He certainly was on. He says it was a 38. It's alleged that it was a 22. He told the office of the district attorney later on that he sold the assassination uh, alleged murder weapon, uh, seized as the h and gun, before the assassination in February 1968. I knew he had the gun and used it in the woods in, in the fall of 1968, and he certainly had it in June of 1968 at the time of the assassination, and I had visual proof, a copy of the receipt. This is the, we'll talk about the gun, uh, uh, the t 22 uh, that uh, uh, Gene yeah. Caesar owned, and that uh, Ted Schrock has uh, actually uh, recovered, was involved in recovering this, uh, this, uh, this 22 from a swamp. In, uh, in Arkansas. Uh, it's Operation Deagre Toy. And you'll read the entire story in Termination 2, the RFK assassination death Ecker report, which will tell my story as the father of the second gun theory. And how I uh, developed the theory, gave birth to it, and then delved into the story, covered it, and lived the story. <coughs> and became familiar with all the players in the establishment, anti-establishment, and what really went on. 
which is an incredible story in itself. Absolutely. And will be told in this book, which will be loaded with photographs and and CDs. Uh, the original pro who really killed Bobby Kennedy, which has been suppressed uh, for more than 35 years now. Now, this is a book report. It's unlike anything that's ever been written. It's not chapter to chapter. It's chronology format. Uh, it tells a storyline, and it's dramatic, it's bizarre, and it's... And more important, it's true. And it's, it's true, true and, and truth the, is not only stranger than fiction, it's often scarier, and uh, well, it's going to jolt people, it's going to boggle the mind when the uh, RFK Hecker report comes out, the Tenturac, uh, Robert Kennedy story and saga. The truth that Gene Caesar killed Robert Kennedy is not going away. Uh, you know, people, it's very difficult to cover up the truth. Um, you know, one leak, uh, one video, or one uh, set of images or whatever can unravel uh, a, a story and, and reveal the truth. And so, uh, you know, the Robert Kennedy killing and the same for the JFK killing and many other killings are not going to be swept under the carpet. They are going to be brought out to the public, and I think that's inevitable. The question, I guess, really is when. So let, let me... Well, the coalition of political assassination which is directed by John Judge. Uh, they coordinate everything. Uh, I have uh, a website now, www.rfk, secondgunexpose.com, www.rfk, secondgunexpose.us, and my own name, www.rfkgate, rfkgatecatchrack.com. But all three uh, names will... Uh, turn you on to my website uh, and you'll get all the information you want and especially the new Second Gun uh, expose film and video uh, in VHS and then later in DVD and then when the book comes out, the RFK Hecker Report, Termination 2, the Robert Kennedy Translation, uh, that'll blow you away. So we have a lot of things in store for you in the 21st century based on the truth and the pursuit of justice in this case and the advancement of the criminal justice system and that means independent crime labs crime labs which are not under the control of police agencies in America or the FBI but are truly independent free from police politics uh, malfeasance incompetence perjury and yes cover-ups like there has been in the Bobby Kennedy case. Yes, and there's not less information as time continues. As time continues, we're getting more and more I information, more images, more uh, audio, and this type of thing. So eventually, truth will be, be known. And also, this interview uh, will be on my webpage, tedhuntington.org, and uh, you can uh, get this tape in its entirety from that web page. Um, That's terrific, and I urge people not only uh, to view your website, Ted, in detail, and our new website, uh, I would say www.rfksecondgunexpose.com, and on the DVD they'll get the classic Golden Globe nominee, The Second Gun, 98 minutes, but they'll get the original, the two hours and 30 minutes, the director's copy, and you'll get the lecture and conference and the ceremony that was Hollywood did in my honor, an interview. So this will be exciting, provocative, and dramatic, and go beyond the murder mystery and the maze which surrounds the Bobby Kennedy tragedy. It's very interesting and very exciting, and I've been working with a young journalist, Jeff Hecker, uh, on this project uh, for eight years, although he's been in touch with me now for almost two decades, and uh, we're very proud of it. And uh, Teddy has been uh, kind enough to provide me with a copy of the second gun. And the second gun, the video, is not an easy thing to find. And this is a tragedy. I think this video uh, should be in every public library. But for some reason, uh, the people in the public libraries and universities look at this type of truth as uh, like almost like it's uh, nudity or human anatomy or sexuality or pornography or something, as if there's something... Uh, something bad because it's so true. Well, that <laughs> is a real life horror show and hopefully with the new uh, website www.rfksecondkindexpose.com we'll get it not only to Mr. and Mrs. America and the world audience but to universities, 
colleges and libraries. There is a demand once the word gets out. And I really want to tell you, if you want to see a museum that will blow you away, yes, go to see the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas. There's a lot of money behind that museum where Lee Harvey Oswald was alleged to have shot at President John F. Kennedy. That's an interesting and exciting and historical museum. But the smaller, demanding, provocative museum is a conspiracy museum at 110 South Market Street across from the JFK Memorial, 10 minutes from Daly Plaza, and it has the premier exhibit Kennedy Brothers, Victims of Conspiracy and Cover-Up, in addition to the Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln conspiracies. It goes that far back. But that is where you will see the Ted Chirac Robert Kennedy exhibit. And you'll see the story truthfully from A to Z, pictorially and with text and frightening, wonderful pictures of the Ted Chirac archive because I have the largest archives in the world independent of the police agencies, film and video and tapes, and that will be made available to the Dr. Henry C. Lee Institute at New Haven University in, in New Haven, Connecticut, along with the Judge Jolin Collection, Legal and Forensic Collection, and the famous collection by criminalist Lowell Bradford, all contributors to my fold, including the eminent late authority, William W. Harper, who gave me an affidavit on December the 28th, 1970, which told me I was right on the money that the lawsuit that I launched against the Los Angeles Police Department for suppression, manufacturing, and destruction of evidence and pointed to a suspect, then Eugene Caesar, and to two different trajectories was authentic. Harper backed me, and Harper was a genius in criminalistics and the inventor of safety belts. He was from the court of last resort. And then Professor McDonald met me through the distinguished forensic pathologist and JFK RFK expert, Dr. Cyril Lecture, who, by the way, is holding a symposium in Pittsburgh on the 40th anniversary uh, of the JFK assassination, just as there'll be a symposium in Dallas under COPA, Coalition of Political Assassinations, Dr. Wick brought me to the homicide seminar years, saw my film, was amazed, he mentions it in his book, Cause of Death, The Second Gun, an excellent film. Even Oliver Stone wrote me to commend me. There's many people in the industry that have seen the film, Norman Lear, Barbara Streisand, the late author Irving Wallace. They all were impressed, especially someone like Otto Preminger, the famous director. He couldn't believe his eyes that there was such a film. So the word has gotten out slowly like a snowball and has been riding and riding and riding. But a lot of secrets had to be kept all these years, but now I'll tell about it in the Echo Report. But if you're in Dallas, don't miss visiting the Conspiracy Museum. And of course, uh, that's directed by Tom D Bowden. Uh, Tom Bowden, the director, and founded by R.B. Cutler. It was Godfrey Isaac a wonderful humanitarian and great attorney that represented my probe independent uh, of Sir Han, because later he assumed the role of Sir Han's attorney, and also he was the attorney for Dr. Thomas Saguchi, the famous pathologist, the coroner of Los Angeles. And uh, with Godfrey Isaac, that went before the American Academy of Forensic Sciences in Chicago and hailed me as the father of the second gun probe and all the sacrifices and work that I was proud to do with my late partner, Gerard L. Kahn. First in making the record album, which will be released on CD in the book, and now uh, the video will again be made available to the public, and then the astonishing DVD. So I hope that everybody will take that in. And, and Cyril Wecht is a person really to look into. He's a very honest person, and his books are very good and a good source for people that are really interested in finding out the facts of what happened to many of these people. Cyril is uh, not a person that keeps very many secrets, I'm glad to say, and so he lets out quite a few secrets that are important to uh, the public. So I'd like to go back to the RFK yes, thing. Yes, he's a brilliant man, yeah. brilliant talent. Very smart guy. The uh, Sirhan 
if, in, uh, getting back to the RFK... Uh, and he's an expert of both of that place, mm -hmm. John and Robert yeah. Kennedy, and even Martin Luther King. He has extraordinary credentials. Yeah. And he also... Has off this uh, yeah. letter yeah. to Judge Jolin, the criminalist Bill Harper, Professor Herbert McDonald, and uh, criminalist Lowell Bradford, and one more man that's been in my corner and is a unique individual, William Bailey, imagine, a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, special agent of the FBI that was on the scene and is told 100% that I'm right on the second gun, Bill Bailey. And of course, he gave his first affidavit to the famous prosecutor and author of Helter Skelter and other books, Vincent Bugliosi, who has been a long time supporter of the Ted Schumach on RFK Pro, including the famous uh, movie star Stuart Whitman, who was nominated for the mark, who gave me a lot of personal and financial support, along with political activist uh, Jim Horowitz. Uh, I cannot uh, fail to mention these names who really helped me uh, get to through the goal line. And that also includes also the welcome uh, association with Paul Trade and Alan Lowenstein in there. Paul Trade who was shot. During the, uh, the Kennedy uh, during the Kennedy killing. And Lois was a former congressman, and of course his aide uh, carried on the fight. Uh, uh, Greg Stone killed him some time to get mm -hmm. suicide. But I'll have more to tell about the mysterious death and the connections again in the Robert Kennedy assassination, termination two. Two meaning one for John F. Kennedy, two for Robert Kennedy. The Jeff Hecker, the young man whom I'm telling my story to, who's reporting the Ted Chirac story. So you can look forward to that. Definitely. And we're going to get into some details about the RFK killing, and I want to make sure that we do. And I'm just going to speculate for a minute, getting into the RFK killing, that Sirhan, Sirhan is a typical young male, uh, no science, far -fetched, full of far-fetched religious stories like most people of gods, devils, and angels, like one of thousands of misguided, uneducated, sexually frustrated young males, as I was, you know, and millions of people are. He uh, was into the occult. There's a lot of evidence. And well, when you say the occult, so what, what, what is the occult exactly? Uh, satanic uh, worshiping or God worshiping? Uh, or a theosophical uh, society uh, that you use violence to, for political uh, reasons. It was uh, founded by uh, Helen uh, Velosky. Sirhan so gets the idea in his head to kill RFK, and he follows RFK around L.A. Is that true? He actually followed RFK for a couple he of years. He and other co-conspirators, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Uh, and uh, he was in the ambassador, Sirhan Bashar Sirhan was in the ambassador hotel yeah. on uh, Sunday, June the 2nd, uh, two nights prior to the 4th and 5th. And, and, like, uh, and like Mark David Chapman for John Lennon, the liberal group, or whatever exists of it, uh, and the Democratic Party failed to detect Sirhan with a gun and ammunition. I mean, incredible failure for the stop violence people in security. Um, but, and I look at Dane uh, uh, Caesar, and I see more of a wealthy, conservative, Republican humans needed somebody to kill RFK. They, they know about the Sirhan Sirhan uh, attempt, but Sirhan is, is completely independent. And uh, they find... they. Through this, they find Caesar at Lockheed from a vast camera network. Caesar is politically uh, motivated. He, uh, you know, uh, admits donating to the George Wallace is a known racist campaign. He hates to see RFK elected and the nation going to the non-racists. And uh, but is also stupid and violent. So the conservative religious Republicans carefully instruct Caesar to get behind RFK and only shoot if Sirhan starts shooting. After Sirhan start shooting, um, Saran has no idea that, uh, you, you know, uh, that uh, cameras are uh, all over the place recording all people and thoughts in the ambassador. And so, I, I well, have to speculate. He was an ultra right winger, and uh, in so far, he was a gold brick, uh, that's the information I got. In other words, somebody that would do anything for money, and he was very opportunistic, and, and well, he worked for Lockheed in the plumbing department. Yeah, this could have been one of millions or thousands of people, so, you know, killed for the president or for God or, you know, uh, many of these uh, type of people are not educated. His frame of mind was anti-Kennedy, yeah. anti-liberal, 
anti the democratic process. And racist. He was a racist, a bigot. And, and I was able to seduce him with my tape recorder and get the proof. When he was unaware of what I was looking for, it took me 60 months to hide down Caesar. So but you did talk to Caesar. That's, uh, yes, that's I was the first to get uh, an interview with him, mm -hmm. and I photographed him too in 1969 uh, in two different meetings, October 7th and uh, October 4th in 1969. Mm -hmm. I was the first in the world to get him, and I kept the secret. And contrary to the Dan Moldea book, which is a whitewash, the world didn't know about Caesar's alleged connection to the RMK assassination until I brought it to the public in a press conference that Godfrey I was going to do before in 1970. And I took a lot of heat, a lot of static, not only from the establishment and the police forces, but from the electronic journalistic community and the LA Times at the time blacked out. But I carried on the fight and I got to Harper and I later still have been vindicated. Yeah, this is absolutely amazing. I cannot believe that this human is not more uh, wealthy and not more uh, expl shown. And I mean, you just had a lone struggle for truth. And I think it is, I, I just can't believe it. I'll talk more about that well, later. Well, thank because there was a conference recently, the 31st anniversary by COPA, and the Citizens Committee to investigate can be assassinated. And I was in the audience. It was surrealistic, uh, not as part of the biggest platform. And I had to remind them, uh, politely, and diplomatically, but with self-assurance, like Will Vincent Bugliosi, the famous uh, attorney, as uh, stated so often, Ted Chirac's voice was a lonely voice out there in a wilderness, uh, when no one believed there was a... Uh, when no one believed there was a second gunman, and uh, calling for the truth, uh, in the Robert Kennedy assassination, a tragedy which shaped the course of world history mm -hmm. and brought into focus the second gun. So I have some important, credible people on my side, and deservedly, I'm very proud of it. So, okay, so there's, a, and you should be, there's a, the, the video of uh, RFK finishing his speech as he, as he says, okay, and let's take it to Chicago, let's win there. And he walks off. And uh, so he walks through the kitchen. Caesar puts immediately his uh, left hand on the right shoulder of RFK and stays very close behind RFK moving forward. He takes it upon himself, Caesar takes it upon himself to come up behind uh, RFK and get really up close to his back. And uh, so. Well, it's very interesting that the Houghton book, Robert Houghton, which is the chief of detectives, special unit center for Los Angeles Police Department. 47 man task force. When the book came out uh, after the trial, he was saying he had no security guards and uh, there were no security guards in the kitchen pantry and there was no right wing in the kitchen pantry. I proved Detective Houghton 100% wrong. I proved that Caesar was a right winger and there were security guards in the pantry and uniform and armed. Again, I took the heat. There was nobody out there but myself and Godfrey Isaac. Uh, we faced the public here in Los Angeles in 1970 and again in 1971 in New York and Washington press conferences. And then back toward uh, the crusading uh, Channel 9, uh, KHJ, now KCAL television, uh, took uh, the attack. He took it to the people on the airwaves. He had the guts to tell the people the facts and told my story and the Harper story and the and the, the Bill uh, Harper affidavit and how it came about night after night. Later he became a Los Angeles County Supervisor and he opened up hearings. Hearings which I testified in Paul Swain and my late friend Lillian Castellano. So this story has gone in waves like shifting lower, higher and higher and higher, bigger and bigger and the truth will make us all strong and stronger and wiser. Yeah. 
and, and for such a liberal person as Robert Kennedy, that the ultra uh, radical right, uh, far right winger uh, Gene Caesar was chosen for security. I mean, a person that was diabolically or di diametrically opposed to uh, Robert Kennedy's views and, and the views of most liberals. I think, uh, what were the people at Ace Security thinking? I mean, if that that was just a very either stupid uh, choice or was an intentional choice. That, uh, you know. Well, those guards like Caesar were brought in from the outside, and that's the mysterious connection to this case that no one has delved into it. Again, we'll delve into it deeply in the RFK Hecker report in termination two uh, on uh, the assassination. People will, re will learn more details mm -hmm. uh, from that book report. Okay, so Sirhan, oh, well, RFK and uh, Caesar move through the uh, pantry. Sirhan moves towards RFK from the front, and Carl Euchre blocks Sirhan. Sirhan never gets uh, uh, less than three feet from the front of RFK, and Sirhan pulls out a gun and starts firing from behind Euchre. All right, well, in front of Euchre. Yeah. Uh, he left from 12 feet. Let's get this straightened out. The gun muzzle was three feet away from mm -hmm. Bobby Kennedy, yeah. maybe the closest two feet, but we had an expert witness the vanquished captain, Edward Manassian, and he said a yard to the grand jury. According to reports by qualified witnesses like Pete Hamill, the New York a writer and columnist, who was walking backwards and others, and Time Magazine, the United Press International, all the news bureaus, they drew their hand standing four to six feet with his hand stretched forward. He never got closer uh, than two feet with the gun. The mother was two uh, feet in front of Euchre, a foot and a half, two feet, but three feet from Kennedy. And now, when an accident happens, you have ten different stories. In this, there was a consistency. Everyone was saying, Sir Han, Bashar, Sir Han, had his arms stretched forward, and he'd have to be doing an Arabian tango dance to be in two firing positions at once. Yeah. All the wounds are from the rear, right to left, back to yeah. front, and down to up. We'll, we'll get into So just actually before that, uh, I should have mentioned that the uh, that uh, Bobby Kennedy reaches and shakes hands with a busboy human uh, there. Is that true? Just that you? is true, but then what people lose sight of, and a lot of lecturers, uh, I know this as a fact, as a witness, uh, Carl Euchre, the major D, was a very credible witness. He was the prosecution's key witness. He had finished shaking Juan Romero, the busboy's hand. And Ted, this story does not come out in recent stories of Juan Romero and Mike and other stories written in the time on the 35th anniversary. This is very important. Euchre swears up and down before he died, and I had the first interviews with him and all the other key witnesses. He had already turned from Juan Romero and was facing Sir Anne. Why, if he wasn't doing that, why did he cover his face if someone is attacking you to protect himself? Mm -hmm. So Euchre dropped his hand. In other words, he was holding his hand uh, in Euchre's uh, left hand, and he, and he dropped it. And then when Kennedy saw the gun, he threw his hands up to his face to protect himself, mm -hmm. and he fell backwards. So in those seconds, although some people will see a vent and remember that he was shaking hands, the last few seconds, Euchre told me in no uncertain terms that Kennedy's hand was back in his hand, and Caesar was right behind him. Yeah. So Sirhan Sirhan has a loaded 22 gun. Is it eight uh, bullets in there, or six bullets? Eight, eight bullets. bullets, eight bullets. And all eight got off. Okay. And so, even Paul Schrade, my friend, doesn't understand the dimensions of what I told the world of the fourth, sustained by the criminal Bill Harper. Sir Han fired all eight shots, and Paul Schrade probably took the first shot, and Sir Han wounded five victims, including Paul Schrade. Yeah. 
and attempted to kill Bobby Kennedy. There's no doubt about yeah. that. So the first shot, he shoots, and it goes, does it go through RFK's jacket? I mean, some, some, uh, there was one that went through RFK's jacket. The four shots in the rear, yes, one did go through the jacket. The, well, Three into the body. Now, one is fatal to the head, oh, fragmented, so, so, and one goes through the shoulder pad, yeah. and, and that went to the ceiling panel, so and Gene, one went up into the neck area. Gene Caesar actually fired four shots, is what you're saying? Gene Caesar yeah. allegedly fired, fired four shots, four shots from okay. the rear, so, and, and, and all four shots emanated from the second gunman. Mm -hmm. So the bullets that we called in the second gun film expose, and in my original probe uh, that are in the door panels and the door uh, panel in the center divider and the, uh, in the jo door jam just outside the kitchen pantry that William Bailey saw and, and he attests to, that's the FBI man and others, they came from Sir Han's gun. There's no if, but, or maybe. Now this attorney for Sir Han wants to make black, white, and white black. And it's foolishness, it's nonsense, it's utter rubbish. Yeah. Just like the story that Sir Han fired blanks. So all the bullets facing Bobby Kennedy and Paul Schrey and my companion, Ira Goldstein, the young companion that got wounded, and Erwin Stroll and Elizabeth Evans, and a broadcaster whom I interviewed, William Wysell, they got bullets from Sir Han's gun firing in front of Kennedy. Well, Sir, Sir Han never, none of his bullets hit Kennedy. Absolutely. The, 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 the first two bullets were not blocked. So the first bullet you think went into Paul Schrade. Yes. Who was standing next to and, Kennedy. Uh, and Kennedy, or behind and Kennedy. Mr. Euchre didn't say, hello, Mr. Assassin, how are you? He grabbed him in a headlock and threw him over to the steam table. He stopped after the second shot. After the second shot. And, yeah. and he's yeah. absolutely sure. He told me that in audio interviews mm -hmm. and later in film before any book came out. So in that instant, now you have the second trajectory from the rear at close razor contact. So it has to be a man going down to the floor or falling to the floor behind Bobby Kennedy. And I'm surprised in interviews with all due respect and admiration for Paul Schrader that he doesn't understand what Godfrey Isaac and myself and what we proved in my sound recordings who really killed Bobby Kennedy, which will be in the book. Uh, and uh, that's 60 minutes, and in my film feature documentary, The Second Gun, which is a real life who done it, it, it establishes again that the bullets that emanated from Sir Han's gun was an in front firing position and wounded all the people. Let's go through the shots. The first shot. Uh, Sir Han fires, um, hits Paul Schrade, who is behind Kennedy, is he not? In, but, right, But behind followed. Gene Caesar, too. So he might have had a good view of Gene Caesar uh, shooting. Not Kennedy. really. Caesar was very close to Bobby Kennedy. Mm. He'd be uh, on, on the, uh, the, well, it would be... On the other side, uh, Kennedy's uh, left. Left. Yeah. But from Kennedy's point of view, you could say it's to the right. Uh, He's walking forward, but Caesar's on the right hand side. Uh, so, but. From behind uh, Kennedy, Caesar's on the right, and Schrade is on the left. From behind Kennedy. Kennedy is behind. I mean, Paul Schrade is behind Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Caesar's right behind on uh, Kennedy's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on, on Caesar's left, though. And, and so Paul Schrade is hit and uh, wounded, but he lived and uh, it wasn't uh, serious. And then for the second shot, what happens with that? Or does, does people know, or nobody really knows? What? Oh, no. Uh, William Wiesel took a shot, mm -hmm. and one was allegedly supposed to have gone to the ceiling and then come down uh, ridiculously, and he had Elizabeth Evans, mm -hmm. and my uh, associate from Continental Broadcasting uh, went through Irwin Stroll's pants, and then uh, hit, oh, another bullet hit him, and then hit Ira Goldstein. Five shots hit the victims and three into the wood panel. Mm -hmm. That makes eight. And four from Caesar's uh, gun allegedly uh, makes another four. When, uh, so that's 12. So yeah. when did uh, Caesar pull out his 22? Was it in his pocket and it was loaded and had eight? Uh, he pulled it out instantly. 
at the first shot or after the first or second shot. Yeah, and I got him on tape saying he pulled. He later denied. He told the LAPD one story, the FBI another story. He didn't want to be uh, taken before the grand jury. He wanted to be kept out of investigation. I can understand why. And instantly, he took out his gun, and that's when the witness saw a security mm -hmm. guard within the uniform. Fire, Within fact. the first or second shot of Sirhan, the second Sirhan starts shooting, Gene Caesar pulls out his gun. He uses his right hand to get the loaded 22 out of his pocket, not the 44 he had in a holster, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure where he had. Well, it was not a 44. Oh no. Uh, Caesar claimed it was a 38, but no, 38. no guns were confiscated, so we don't know which gun or uh, you know mm -hmm. the lead that he had his 22. It was a backup weapon, but. So, so Caesar must have been relatively nervous. I mean, he's killing the next president of the USA. He, t he pulled out his gun, and he shoots. The, the first time, he must have been very nervous, and he just shoots, and he gets into RFK's armpit, I guess. He doesn't get high enough uh, to the... Well, he's the, falling to the floor. Oh, he's, he's falling dropping to, to the floor. So he gets all four shots off, and he panics. He doesn't stay around. He runs out of the room. Well, well I mean, he and gets one he shot. He doesn't believe... Uh, that he did what he did. That's the thing. He locked, he locked that well, in his conscious mind. He proudly approached the police and well, said, I suppose you want a statement from me. That sounds to me like he knew he was an ethical human that had done a terrible well, thing on the, the police. Well, the round, police rounded up all kind of witnesses. He had to volunteer. They didn't want to even question him. He had to approach the police himself. I mean, according to one thing I read. The, but so he shot once nervously. I, I question whether he was really falling down because he had some precision. There. He shot into RFK, got his armpit. The second shot into his armpit too, I guess. The third shot, though, fatally into the back of his skull. This is the shot that kills RFK. He must have regained a second to think and regained his composure before he dumped a bullet into the back of RFK. And, and the, yeah, it could have been the fourth shot. Some people or the fourth the shot, perhaps. Yeah, how did he get a fourth shot out after? Well, or it could have been the first shot, and and then a uh, shot through the armpit, and uh, one uh, in the back of the armpit that went out through his chest and up to the ceiling panel, and the one that went through the shoulder pad went to the ceiling panel. Yeah. That didn't go to his body, but one went right up to his neck. So the one through the shoulder pad didn't touch any part of his body. No. Went through the shoulder pad. That's why they say three shots. And oh, I see. But it did come from behind, in your Yeah. Case. Yeah, and I witnessed Donald Truman, the courier for CBS, when we interviewed 10 or 15 minutes after the assassination. He claims, of course, that he saw the guard pulling out his gun instantly and fire. And he remembers three distinct shots. I had other witnesses believe there were 10 to 12 shots, like Booker Griffin. All this was researched during 1960, 69 before I filed the first lawsuit. So nobody sees RFK turning around and grabbing Caesar by the throat, pulling off the clip on tie. No, that's and, a story and manufactured by again. John Christian. Uh, it's a phony story. None of the witnesses say that, that they saw Kennedy grab him in any way. We knew that I first learned on tape that his tie dropped. The first time Christian heard about the second gun aspect of the case, was at my Los Angeles press conference on June the 4th, 1970. A date, 1970, a date, two years after his assassination, a date that you will find in none of the books on the RFK assassination, because the books are complete <coughs> with historical revisionism and fabrications, mm -hmm. and uh, Christian uh, contributed vastly to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's very interesting. So, uh, but uh, at one point, I'm not sure what bullet uh, from Mr. Hans Ron's gun, but Rosie Greer and Carl uh, and Carl uh, Uecker wrestled the gun away from Sir Hans Sir Hans. Yeah, well, Rosie, well, Greer, Rosie Greer, he cried when I interviewed him. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. They tried to make him out the hero. The real hero was Carl Uecker, who stopped Sir Hans after the second shot until Caesar's alleged murder weapon did the job. Uh, the real uh, hero was Carl Eucher, who probably saved Kennedy's life if there wasn't a second gunman. Yeah. But 
Rosie Greer and Rayford Johnson, the athletes, they rushed from behind and helped Carl Eucher and other people. Kennedy Ice pounded the table and the gun was pulled in a certain amount of time. And they said, get the gun, get the gun. It was madness going on in that kitchen factory. So you think the world of chaos, uh, chaos and insanity, the life a human or a hurricane. And uh, violence, you know, you know, violence, whether, I, I mean, I don't think uh, yeah, insanity that's is important. And another story violence. which yeah. originated from Christian was the story that said I was firing blanks and then was uh, uh, yeah, that's and golf and, and mushroom into fantasy land, Disneyland, by a researcher named Rosalind Magnus, and then taken as part of the crusade by another uh, writer, uh, Linda Peace. So they do get the gun, uh, Greer and, and Euchre get the gun away from Sir So how did he get off each shot if the gun was wrestled away from him? That was after the eight well, shot. Well, they fired. shot the gun was frozen in his hand, and he was he firing wide, yeah. wildly. He couldn't see Bobby Kennedy because Euchre had him over the serving table, the steel table, and had him in a headlock. And so were the other Kennedy people and famous photographs. They started shooting pictures, uh, pounding Sharan, his arm on the table trying to wrestle a gun from him. So, for example, probably shots five, six, seven, and eight, the last four shots probably just went off to the side or something, didn't hurt anybody or didn't uh, connect with any humans. They hit the center divider and the door jam. And later on, the FBI man or the FBI personnel, they weren't officially in charge of the case. They saw these bullet holes. And so did other photographer, John Shirley. And there was Associated Press photograph which showed a bullet in the door jam. They all came from Sir Hans Gun. And that uh, sounds like one pissed off human to just keep firing, you know, up angry, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> he got off eight shots. Yeah. So, so, uh, so it's a very distinct trajectory. The second gunman fired from behind. So then what happens, the Caesar puts his gun back into his pocket, the gun that kills uh, Kennedy, and uh, he, uh, I guess, into his pocket. And then uh, the no cameras or microphones, uh, only one ABC video that doesn't show really anything, and two or three audio tapes are shown to the public. Uh, probably there's a, probably a vast archive of hidden cameras and hidden microphones that we can only speculate. Well, no, there is a fact that Andy West was broadcasting, and we could broadcasting. But what the world doesn't know is that we had our own broadcast tape going. My uh, 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 television uh, crew uh, broadcaster uh, and uh, confederate Jeff Hecker, <laughs> now Jeff Hecker, he's the new writer on the RFK book report. Uh, Jeff Brent, he turned on his tape recorder, and he captured the actuality of the shot. So it was the Jeff Benz tape, and I have that actuality exclusively in my film called The Second Gun. Mm -hmm. And on my sound recordings, my probe, my audio probe, really so Bobby Kennedy. So, so after the shooting, uh, Caesar is not even questioned until he approaches a person in uh, the police and says, I suppose you want a statement from me. You know, sort of Well, they were taken down to Rampart Station. All the witnesses were gathered in a room in the embassy ballroom, and he, they interviewed him right he didn't want any further interviews. And he gave an interview to the FBI and he told them, by all means, keep me up. And he had plenty to hide. <coughs> and nobody came to bother him until I came after 16 months. And of course, I didn't tell him what I was looking for. I just let him ride along uh, and talk and talk and got all the facts. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I did psychological stress evaluation test on his face. Well, I don't know. It's like a polygraph. I'm not sure how much that. I don't really. Well, it's not admitted in, in the court of law, but it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, from the point of view that it destroys the validity of the uh, polygraph test, which is gun science anyway. But yeah. you can take your own point of view. Yeah. So, so after the uh, the killing, uh, you know, his gun, of course, is not even taken in, or he's not even searched for a weapon. Uh, and the people protect Gene Caesar. Why do they protect Gene Caesar? Uh, you know, Caesar... Uh, you have to understand that when you read the RFK Echo Report, the Tetra Act, Bobby Kennedy's father. In other words, 
he is only a cog in the wheel. He's a spike in that big wheel. And uh, he's a player, like Sir Han is a player. In other words, it was important that they didn't know each other and they're utilized. Obviously, if it was successful, we would have seen a Jack Ruby where Sir Han was limited. But in those seconds, you can't get into Caesar's mind. Uh, he allegedly made the decision to fire his gun and shoot distinctly at Bobby Kennedy. But Caesar, Sir Han is a, a programmed uh, hypnotized assassin. Caesar is a marionette, the puppet, like the other guys. It was soldier, a more like a foot soldier that uh, basically. So he doesn't him. know who is managing him and who's yeah. behind. He is brought in like the other guys to William Card to well, the security, and that's the story. And you can read a lot of the details in Marty Kingfish, Carlos Marcello, and the JFK assassination with the chapter devoted to my work by John Davis. The other good book besides uh, John Davis, who is a prolific author, is a, a brilliant by David Chime, Contract on America, to understand the elements. Or even Sybil Link, the Bert Sugar's book, The Assassination Chain. Just think that if Caesar is captured and tried and convicted, that would involve other people, like the people at Lockheed that employed him, the people at the ambassador that uh, were in charge of security, well, and ace security. I mean, they would all be brought into this... Uh, because they wouldn't. <laughs> they wanted to protect reputations, and heads would roll. They had a particular offense the police department and the official investigation. Yeah, and uh, so you'll never see the day uh, where Caesar is indicted or that this story will ever get in the court of law, let alone a blue ribbon congressional investigation. It's going to go down in the history books as one of the unsolved uh, crimes of the 20th century. Well, I think it will be exposed eventually when all the video and more... Uh, well, it's exposed, it's exposed in the second gun expose, and it will be exposed in the termination to the Jeff Hecker RFK report. So, Caesar did the shooting, though, and others would escape serious jail uh, sentences, I think, because he was the human that did the firing. So, I mean, they just simply paid him or instructed him or commanded him or whatever. Uh, so well, they could toss him away uh, because if Kennedy gone through other exits, there were other uh, conspirators and, and other security guards. And if it's gone over as planned, I guess the man would have been fired. Uh, upon, and he'd be dead, but it didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, Sir Anne totally missed Bobby Kennedy, and the security guard fired mm -hmm. this thing to four shots yeah. at that moment, finishing the job. He didn't get his gun out far enough to hit Bobby Kennedy. There was panic in that room, and uh, he professionally knocked out Bobby Kennedy. And that's what Harper says, uh, it was a professional hit. While Sir Han shot with that shooting was of that of an amateur and wild. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Sir Han was completely unconnected to the vast, wealthy, high tech machinery that uh, Gene Caesar was connected to. But so, minutes later, uh, being unwatched, undemocratic, and uneducated, religious, and never policed or punished for violence, the people in the highest parts of the Los Angeles County and city police and trust state and FBI send the order through the camera nets that uh, Sir Han is to be the only person tried. Um, and this is easy. The uh, local, or, or the four national television stations are owned by conservative religious people and perhaps fear possible violence uh, on individual reporting people if they um, in, in run stories implicating Caesar. I mean, all that is needed is one DA to not charge Caesar or one or two public defenders to not bring him to the stand. Well, if that... I mean, Egg it falls doesn't take much. And the whole house of cards mm -hmm. falls. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to protect their reputations because that opens up a whole can of words if there ever was an indictment. Mm -hmm. indictment. So, I mean, and then, so the, 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 the district attorney, uh, Evel Younger, I mean, hello, evil? I don't know if you can see this guy covered the entire thing up. Uh, he refused to even question whether Gene Caesar and Daryl Gates. Uh, this is Daryl Gates is a person that said casual drug users should be shot. 
uh, not realizing he was supposed to be enforcing 100-year-old assault and homicide laws, I guess. And uh, Daryl well, Gates uh, went before the Los Angeles City Council and said that the uh, ceiling panels, which would uh, probably prove that there were extra shots and disappeared the bullet holes, and the bullets uh, were destroyed uh, after the trial. They were destroyed after uh, I called upon the release of those ceiling panels at the press conference of June 4, 1970, through my attorney, Godfrey Isaac, when we filed action for suppression of evidence. Yeah. yeah. And one. Uh, well, the case went on with Paul Trade taking uh, an in charge position and filing his own lawsuit, hiring uh, an attorney, Mal Levine, first, and then the famous prosecutor, Vincent Mobiosi, who was now in fact of Albert Longstein to get the gun refired. Uh, there were a lot of pressures on that lawsuit, and I stepped aside to my attorney, Godfrey Isaac, who represents Sir Land, hoping the truth would come out of Sir Land trial. But that's a long yeah. story, and it's a mishmash of what happened, and, and the sabotage, and the political infighting, and the change of attorneys, which again will be in the RFK Hecker report. And so, uh, also, um Dennis Wolfer, I guess is the person's name. Dwayne Wolfer. Oh, Dwayne, 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 yeah, Dwayne Wolfer, yeah. Up in the Los Angeles Police Department. They're firearms. They in said. charge of the... Uh, well, the that's fine. Right. Well, yes, and uh, he became later the director. But and just and he's, where, he's where the cover-up took place. Yeah, he's just a typical... Uh, he, he, uh, he, he's the main uh, spike in the wheel uh, in the crime lab where they covered up the evidence and they used another gun uh, for test flying not to hands the gun. They told the world when we bought it that uh, out in the open in May of 1971 that uh, they used the, the, the test gun only for sound testing, acoustic testing. When we had proof that they fired it on uh, June the 6th and only that later on a researcher, Rosalind Magnus, from the State Archives, found the exhibit that they fired the Sir Handgun on June the 5th. But they probably couldn't get a match to his body in this other test gun, and they fired it. And those test bullets went into evidence. They claimed it was only a clerical error. There was no clerical yeah, error. Yeah, just incredibly it was, dishonest. It was uh, an establishment cover-up. Yeah, they're like-minded, conservative, anti-truth, anti-pleasure, religious, married... Uh, domino prototype soldier type, what's the word, cookie cutter type of march in lockstep type of soldier type conservative religious people and uh, covering up the truth and, at every step. It's just unbelievable to me. And that uh, never exposed, never policed. And, uh, so anyway, I mean, the covering up the truth and doing deception is not an easy thing to do. I mean, one leak and all people involved are exposed and not trusted for lying and being dishonest. So um, what's interesting is that bullets from Caesar's gun are recovered and destroyed by Wolfer. Is that well, true? the most important thing is, uh, yes, that Wolfer stated in the Saran trial that the bullets came from Saran's gun and only Saran's gun and no other gun. Well, that was the worst kind of perjury, to quote criminal slow Bradford, because later a seven-man panel, a famous criminalist, could not substantiate what Wolfram told the jury and the world that, that the bullets did match. They couldn't prove they matched. They couldn't prove whether there was a first, second, third, or any other kind of gun. Uh, so uh, it remains... A story without an end, as Judge Robert Jolie, uh, who's an expert in this case, has repeatedly said and spoken about at the American Academy of Forensic Science uh, conventions and symposiums. This is an interesting uh, part that is never raised in the uh, Kennedy killings, and that the Kennedys were um, being Catholic. Um, like the World War II Holocaust and, and the killing of uh, Jewish people and other political prisoners, um, were perhaps by, maybe this is an, indi an indication of the religious intolerance. Like most people, they don't uh, realize that the World War II Holocaust, that the anti-Semitism between Jesus-based and uh, Judaism 
you know, and, and anti-Semitism is a deep root in Christianity. And so that was really, that, with, many people claim that without the anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish uh, feeling, the feeling that Jewish people were heretics by many of the ultra-Christian uh, Jesus-based people, many of the atrocities of World War II would probably never have happened. And I think the same thing might be true. Do you think that there was a, a, a religious intolerance? Like many of the people in the USA are Protestant, and that was inherited from Britain and Germany. And uh, do you think that the, you were saying the evidence was burned? As if it were heretical, the clothing that Robert Kennedy wore somehow was viewed as uh, by the Puritan uh, Protestant. But do you think there was an anti-tolerant, uh, anti uh, a religious intolerance aspect to uh, killing of the Kennedys, or Robert Kennedy in particular? Well, uh, the mafia uh, was responsible for the, for the killing of Robert Kennedy. Uh, you don't think it was right-wing Republican? Yeah, it was, it was right-wingers that were used, and uh, people with an axe to grind, uh, like in the Palestinian and Israeli issue, the politics of the Middle East, but the Mafia had a vendetta. Uh, they felt they gave the lecture to John F. Kennedy. They helped him in Illinois, and if Bobby went after them when he was Attorney General, they wanted to cut off the head of the state, meeting the President John F. Kennedy. And Bobby Kennedy started a right uh, run. They didn't want him to run for president, and then it gets involved into another area of Jimmy Hoffa uh, and the uh, the vengeance he had against Bobby Kennedy and the mob. And we'll tell in detail what yeah. you can see uh, in the report. Okay, so a extreme uh, review that you had uh, has to do with his background uh, coming uh, from the state of Israel and the Palestinian or Arab Israeli War of 1948, and his views were shaped by uh, the course of events there. So, but, in so and, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy had covered the 1948 war, and Kennedy was, uh, uh, said something with six for Han and the other Arabs off, that he was going to uh, send Israel 50 bombers. He went to some rally or something and heard that. That's well documented in the Kaiser book. Mm -hmm. Getting to the other end, and the Kaiser came aside. And so, Tom Noguchi really, I think, is uh, another hero of the RFK story. Incredibly brave, smart, and honest Japanese male human, the Los Angeles County coroner, puts a snag in the million man cover up and reveals publicly that RFK is shot three times at close range in the back of the body. Powder burns prove that the gun was less than one inch away. Shockingly, uh, the idiot paid for people defending Sirhan, tell Noguchi not to go into the, quote, gory details, unquote, that would have clearly showed that uh, Gene Caesar shot RFK. So, I mean, your comments on uh, Noguchi, a brave guy to come out and, and stick to his uh, Well, Noguchi, science. Uh, they try to be thrown. Oh, yeah. And uh, they try to make him arrive him. That he was a crazy man. He was on drugs. That he performed an autopsy uh, that uh, was uh, lacking in confidence uh, and was uh, less than perfect. It was all nonsense. They tried to uh, squash his reputation, and Godfrey Isaac took the case and won. And Meguchi was the first in the world to say that all the wounds were from behind, and the, the fatal wound was probably half an inch away. Meguchi said, you, know, you can give an inch up to three inches. All the wounds are within that one inch to three inch radius from behind. But the Gucci never got to testify in the Saran trial because they said the details would be too gory. So he was kept off the witness hand and then they fired him and attacked his yeah, it's a, reputation. It's just a complete cover up. But, but, but amazingly, we, we got him to the sky, any other trial. The theft of his photographs and the uh, disappearance, and I'm the one that pulled that off to his grand brother, Adele. When he heard it, he said, if he had a thousand cops, he'd take them off to me. I scouted where the Gucci was, 
and was able uh, to gain entrance uh, to the pathology section of the USC University Hospital in Southern California and subpoena, subpoena the who she justified in the in that trial. So he was able to go into details mm -hmm. in that trial many years later, although it's doubtful whether the jury of the Indian trial fully understood the dimension of what the Gucci was saying because the judge of the Indian trial wouldn't let some, uh, a lot of that evidence, uh, you know, into the court record. So Sirhan Sirhan is convicted and is sentenced to be killed. I mean, I think this is proof of the death penalty with the current closed 12 human jury system only or whatever is nowhere near being fair and accurate. Uh, you know, and Gene Caesar's never even called to testify. Um, you know, it's just amazing that Sirhan Sirhan was going to be killed, except that uh, somebody in the Supreme Court uh, of California uh, put a stop on the death penalty. No, in 1972, the United States Supreme Court oh, United States put uh, a hold on all executions. I mean, so, yeah, he would have been killed, and he didn't so actually kill him. You, yeah, at that time, that's... Mm -hmm. uh, how I editorialized at the end of the second John film probe and you see the film. Uh, but then he he was saved uh, by that to see the United States Supreme Court and sent to life imprisonment but subject to parole, but he's never been able to be let out on parole. Yeah, he could be let out on parole. I think he should be in prison for life for shooting uh Yeah, Jayden well there's an attorney is arguing otherwise. Well, the attorney buried the fact that Saran was there and uh, fired at Bobby J. Lee, attempted to kill him, and tried to whitewash the whole endeavor and, and create an entirely new thing. So Hubert Humphrey, who is one of the few people to speak out against violence, he says, we're the nonviolent majority. You know, I think that was a pretty nice statement. And Hubert Humphrey is the next most popular human and is the Democratic uh, he's the nominee on the, the final two-party ballot and loses to Nixon. And Nixon, barely. Barely. Nixon says after winning, well, after losing a close one four years ago, I can say this, and a prop gun is fired off screen and makes a loud bang like the sound of a gun. Nixon continues, winning is a lot more fun. And I, I think that this is as close to fascism as the USA has ever gotten. Would you agree with that? Or <laughs> he makes a joke about the Kennedy killing, I think. Well, there's a lot of it being statements that were made. Uh, he was a brutal, and, brutal guy. And, and some yeah. are made. And well, I can, pardon me, I can read Margaret Kingfish by John Davis, a mm -hmm. contract I made for by David mm -hmm. Stein, and you'll read the whole story. But, you know, to me, reading text, right but reading text, it's difficult to know if it's really true. Now, if we had some video, surveillance video, or video of what people were thinking, then I would believe it more. That's really what we need, the audio tapes and things like that. Although they can be faked, but still, an image is a much more convincing piece of evidence. So do you think that Nixon was connected to the RFK killing? I mean, Nixon clearly benefited. If, uh, I guess the theory is if you're not the most popular, kill the, the competition. I mean, it's a sour victory. But, well, uh, he did not want to run against another Kennedy. Again, it's documented in the books. But I will tell the entire story. There was Watergate before there was Watergate. That's why I say RFK did. Uh, uh, Nixon was Attorney General, John Mitchell, and uh, and their connection to a source that's very well known, uh, a mafia attorney, and uh, there'd be plenty of money and resources put behind to eliminate Bobby Kennedy so he shouldn't run against Nixon. So the deed was done without Nixon paid an unwitting uh, role in this, but the deed was done with it. He didn't have that formal knowledge. Uh, and Nixon was just a bad guy. You know, we yeah. were going to get the Kennedys educated, enlightened. And there was a lot of behind-the-scenes details. I don't want to discuss it until the RFK report comes okay. out. Okay. Uh, in the Hecker report. And then you'll understand the dimensions. But in the interim, you can read the Davis book, Audrey Kingfish, and the, the Shine book. So, so Nixon, the, in America. Nixon was clearly linked to Frank Sturgis, or Frank Fiorini Sturgis, and uh, E. Howard Hunt. 
through Watergate. Uh, Sturgis is most likely the human that shot JFK from the front. This is JFK uh, in 1963 um, from the front behind the picket, picket fence. And Nixon later says the famous quote, there can be no whitewash in the White House. And almost as if, I mean, when you hear the word whitewash, the first thing you think of is picket fence and Tom Sawyer and this type of thing. And I think it's an appeal, the use of the word white, to racism, to white perhaps expressing views of white supremacy and racism. Nixon was, you know, a so-called anti-communist trooper human. I mean, ever, uh, even through, um, although even though he cared little for democracy, truth, freedom of information, or science, I mean, do you think that he planted the microfilm in the pumpkin uh, ruining Alger Hiss's career? Do you think, I mean, because he's that type of person, I think, that would plant video tape. Well, I would have speculation. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt anything that Nixon did based on the fact I'd recommend all of his film books. I mean, film. Bill Nixon. Nixon. Uh, it's an extraordinary mm-hmm. film. And uh, tells me so. And there are many books on Nixon. People will be analyzing Nixon 100 years from now. He was a a weird and strange and diabolical character in history. And uh, it was a thug of a And the story, <laughs> whatever uh, you've read and, and want to delve into the JFK assassination, there are many researchers that come to the Copa College and political thinking conferences that come to Dallas this year in November, uh, 2003, and they have their viewpoints and they have solid information. Uh, and many, much of it often is speculative too. But I do know of the interest in the honor of case assassination, and uh, I'm going to connect all the dots. Something uh, that Dan Obey, as the last major author on the Bobby Kennedy assassination, could not do, did not do, and I promise I will. That would be awesome. Without censoring yourself or any information in any way, please connect the dots. For all the public, and they they are yeah. vastly underinformed. But this is a book report, and it's using the chronology format. But it'll be different than any book that's ever been published. And I'm sure, uh, well, you know, the word will hit the, the fence. Uh, when yeah, that's right. On the echo report, So here we are, 2003 A.D. system. That's where the uh, Christian time system we're in. And uh, 35 years later, between the killing of Robert Kennedy and now. Gene Caesar is never charged. He lives 35 years of freedom. He never, not even one story on TV and movies. All the people in TV news, music, acting, television and film, not one person reveals that Gene Caesar killed RFK to the public except you, Ted Chirac. Uh, do they live in fear? Did they support the RFK killing? Are they just simply stupid and uneducated? Are they as fascist as Caesar is? Or are they just simply apathetic? I mean, what is your explanation for the, the, the complete apathy and not a mention that Gene Caesar might be even remotely connected to the killing of our Because they can't admit to that fact. Otherwise, their professional reputation, law enforcement, and American justice is on trial in America. Once one link goes, then the whole chain breaks down. And uh, the only one who's saying that today is Sir Hans Stern attorney, uh, Larry Teeter, but he's trying to uh, uh, absolve Saran of any guilt whatsoever, saying he's not culpable in any way, that he's totally innocent. Uh, and uh, that is totally ridiculous and without any uh, foundation. But, uh, I mean, we can make a case that uh, Saran had no criminal intent. And well, I, he if knew not, what he was doing. I, I think there's plenty of but, intent. He pulled the trigger. But, <laughs> but it's the same thing as protecting Dwayne Wolfer, who became the director of the crime lab. The heart of the Robert Kennedy uh, conspiracy and cover-up, as is demonstrated in my exhibit in Dallas at the Conspiracy Museum, is the fact that the cover-up took place in the crime lab. And, in California, too. And I mean, why did the world cry out when seven experts couldn't match the bullets? The press lose sight of that factor. And Wolfer uh, then committed perjury by saying that he did match the bullets. There's no way he could match those bullets. They can't be matched. 
And, and I mean, unless Sirhan Sirhan was, the new technology was used to physically move his muscles to pull the trigger by beaming things out of the back of his brain, I think he's, he has some sense. Well, we'll tell the good. whole story of Operation Deeper Toy. Yeah. And I went to <laughs> Alabama, Arkansas mainly, uh, Missouri, to the states, five different groups looking for the things they've done. And if you lost a little needle, and it's very hot and humid in this room now, I'm having a lot of trouble with my eyes. The tiniest needle in the cupboard would be easier to find that needle than to find Caesar's uh, alleged murder weapon. But we do have Caesar's weapon. You can see it at the Conspiracy Museum across the JFK Memorial in Dallas, Texas. Well, that's the thing he was uh, dredged from a swamp. From a swamp, and we'll tell the whole and, story. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and people came running out of the bushes or whatever at, at the time. Uh, the, the yeah, with, with, with guns and uh, silence. Uh, the thieves that I knew and identified many years ago. You had to get them out of prison for this gun. <coughs> well, he got out of... Yeah, one of the thieves had a big, long rap sheet and he got out of prison. And then we sent down heavy-duty men, let's say, uh, almost ten years ago. And they completed the uh, research for a season done based on my research operation in the toy was a success. It was brought to Los Angeles, tested by SEAL Laboratory, Dr. Iron and Kumar here. And then and then I facilitated uh, sometime later uh, for it to be uh, removed to the Ted Shulak Arcade exhibit at the Conspiracy Museum in Dallas, Texas. Okay, that was and a showcase there. Quickly, you talked with Gene Caesar. What are your impressions from that interview? Uh, and your, so what are your impressions? Well, that's a good question. Thank you, Gene Caesar. Uh, I thought I'd indicated it was a bigot. Uh, he was not too smart. He was kind of uh, a dumb guy with an attitude. Uh, I saw examples of his violence uh, when he uh, raised his voice and threatened uh, one of the kids uh, in his apartment. Uh, he was a man uh, who really hated the Kennedys, who had been down to Nazi meeting. Uh, he had he hated the black people, and uh, he was Mr. Dumb Dumb. And his ego was enormous as big as this room, but he wanted to get his place in history, and I afforded him the opportunity, and I was interested in finding out the truth. So he rattled off. He had diarrhea of the mouth, and I seduced him with my tape recorder, uh, whereas many years later, Dan Mulday had caught him uh, when Caesar knew what he was after. And Caesar, in my impressions, buried into his subconscious that he didn't do what he did. He convinced himself. The years had passed, he wasn't questioned by law enforcement authorities. Nothing happened until I came out. And then he claimed he didn't even own a twenty two gun. He had a twenty two rifle only, which was a big lie. And then he told the police under investigation later on in nineteen seventy one that he did own the gun, but he sold it before the assassination. So he was not a particularly bright guy. In my investigation, I learned he'd do anything for a buck. And, um, uh, There's a quote of, uh, tell me if this sounds like uh, Gene Caesar, a quote of him saying, the gun started firing by then. Was that close? <laughs> yeah, well, he had said, <laughs> he was interviewed by a guy named Ken Marshall and said there were three shots. But the other guy told him that the big trouble, Caesar chuckled. He, he laughed. At, at Caesar's wounds, uh, I mean, at Kennedy's wounds, and he, he chuckled, well, maybe Jack Merritt who predicted there'd be big trouble and I wish something was going to happen that night, that maybe he knew something I did. And uh, Caesar has something in common with uh, Lisa Peace, who chuckles and giggles at everything she says and uh, claims today uh, in a book report that's your hand fired blanks, which uh, on the face of it is uh, 
a stupid state. Well, mil millions of people are interested in, in John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, the person, and the, and the Kennedy family, and Teddy Kennedy, too, and uh, just uh, what they were like. And what were your interactions with RFK and, and John Kennedy or Teddy Kennedy and the Kennedy? Uh, I think people would be interested in knowing exactly what Built my own hotel, which was the headquarters of John F. Kennedy. And uh, he was coming out of the office. I stopped and talked to him briefly, and I'm holding some lifesavers, so I said, We came for a lifesaver. Uh, I saw him doing a campaign trail with a photograph of myself at the audience with him. And then when he was at the Ambassador Hotel two nights before the tragedy in Coconut Grove, he went to a rally in a court. And uh, he stood up before the crowds, made a rally speech, and uh, I said, uh, Senator, you don't need lifesavers tonight. You don't need a lifesaver. You've got all these people behind you, and he laughed. Um, after the assassination, one of my tapes was finished, which was the first public entity contrary to the, to the Dan Muldea book, which said this erupted in an alternative news paper in the free press. They erupted first in my tapes, the audio report, my investigation, in 68, 69, we really told Bobby Kennedy. I took the tapes at the Senator Kennedy's office, and his press secretary, Dick Drain, turned and said, we don't care, we didn't care less, go to the police. It was too sensitive a subject. Teddy Kennedy was being threatened with death letters. Uh, he had been in Chicago. I went to the Kennedy, I, I met them in New York, including Jeff Greenwald, who became a television commentator, and Jack Moonfield, who uh, a researcher later, that's the Wagner Committee to Investigate Assassinations. It all come out in the Ted Chirac, obviously, in the Jim Hecker report termination, too, on the RFK assassination. Uh, so this... Uh, was a bewildering story. Eddie Kennedy uh, didn't want to have anything to do with it. I met in later years with his friend, former Senator uh, Penny, and he said even though uh, Kennedy was skeptical of the facts in both assassination of John and Robert Kennedy, he didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. It was too deeply a sensitive subject and he couldn't handle it and it was for others. And I went to him now in Lone State. Uh, so I left Kennedy Kennedy's office, and I had an opportunity to play the tapes for Bobby Kennedy's secretary, Frank Manquist. And he said, you can't do this alone, Dad. You're going to need help. You'll get help. That never did come. Uh, Lone State made a promise to me, Robert Vaughn, Vaughn home on July the 3rd, 1973, that I would get support, and he would come out front but when the film opened to great reviews, second time, Lone Stain was nowhere to be seen. And he stayed undercover for a long time, for a year, until Harper's Magazine, through uh, the resourcefulness and tenacity of uh, Betsy Langman and editor Louis Lappin and hiring Alex Colbert, an author, they got the story. Who really shot Bobby Kennedy? And Lone Stain brought in his pal Paul Strait, and they went public in press conference. New York to Los Angeles, and uh, they began to ride their own separate horse, white horses, and as Paul Schrade said, well, we were on parallel courses with the same goal, but I guess uh, working from opposite ends, uh, uh, there was never any unity in the, uh, in the assassination research community, always disunity, rivalries, jealousies, uh, pettiness. And that's what could contribute to the downfall, and uh, especially the attack on the, on the attorneys. And one attorney, Luke McKissick, deliberately and intensely, he was up against the land for years, tried to sabotage the Sir uh, uh case uh, and the second kind of development and undermined me. And another attorney, Roger Hansen, handled an incompetent and commented in a way, Luke McKissick was the attorney that was a saboteur 
And uh, the other attorney, currently in Mary Jeter, he practiced what I would say, uh, mad law. Uh, it's, a, it's a healthy turvy case beyond belief. Every, he's thrown everything with the kitchen sink, including the mafia and the Vietnam War, into his rich. And he has gone nowhere, and he will go nowhere. Uh, it's most unfortunate. You know, so the problem in capturing, trying, and uh, convicting and locking in prison, Gene Caesar, is that what person would be responsible to do this? The Los Angeles County District Attorney now, Steve Cooley. Um, I mean, he, this is a person who went to a male-only Jesus-based school. Uh, no, it provides no data on the number of charges, convictions that he's done. But I think if they did, the people would find that there are zero warrants for violent crime and infinity warrants for sex and drug-related crimes. I mean, for example, this is a person who charged Paula Poundstone, not Gene Caesar, with, uh, you know, a crime, and then Pee Wee Herman with child pornography, not O.J. and company. So, I mean, here's a person who doesn't care much about... Well, he's the latest of it, he's attorney. He's not going to do anything. Which would sour the reputation of the office of the district attorney in the law enforcement department and give law enforcement in California at the highest level the attorney general's department all a black eye. A black eye, and, I mean, uh, and also, for being honest and, uh, and arresting and, uh, I think it would be. So you have Joseph Bush, the late district attorney, and Evel Young, who's the late attorney general that prosecuted the Koran, uh, all part of the alleged cover-up. Yeah, they're brutal Christian, uh, far-right-wing or conservative Republican people. And, and they don't want the truth right. out. And, uh, and they're really going to uh, be judged by history. And uh, when the, uh, the Ted Chirac story comes out in the Jeff Hecker report, I think it'll blow them away and everybody else too. You know, I'm he, taking off the gloves. I'm not handling this with silk gloves. There's yeah. plenty of blame to go around to share. Mm-hmm. Paul Schrader has done an admirable job of trying to get grand jury interest, but uh, I wanted it before a congressional committee. By the time Paul Schrader got together with me again, it was a failed process. And Lowen Stein was shot dead. Uh, his uh, aide and top man Friday. Greg Stone had committed suicide. Uh, it's a strange, weird, and puzzling story. The, uh, well, you know, what person would want to be a district attorney? I mean, it's too much thing based on one person. That should well, be there's a, other court uh, uh, district uh, attorneys uh, that could have said. Betsy Langman uh, had gone to a, a Reiner, the other guy, Ira Reiner, district attorney. He would nobody had the guts to take this on because it was made in the truth which made the entire office of the district attorney. They prosecuted Sirhan. They wanted a simple case. Sirhan, Sirhan alone killed Bobby Kennedy. There was no conspiracy. Uh, and let the case die and rest. And along comes Ted Chirac and tells them differently. Uh, <laughs> and they didn't like it. Uh, and they hated me for it. Yeah. And then the other office that came in in the 1980s, uh, they were jealous of what I had accomplished, so they tried to write me out of history. But I'm proud that I got the establishment. Uh, even Time Magazine to attack me with, with photographs and a whole page uh, devoted not in the law page, not uh, well, it was in the law page, surprisingly enough, not even in the press page or the movie page. Uh, the review of the, of the second gun. Yeah. But we made Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, two major stories, the London Times, you made the establishment press. And the London Don said, uh, the hearings in Los Angeles is a, a triumph for the tenacity and resolute determination of Ted Chirac. And of course the effort, a great deal of credit Gale goes to Paul Frey to get them to refire the gun under the auspices of Alan Lowell and saying, and the articulate uh, uh, great attorney Vincent Bugliosi. But they wrote out this long story of God's the eyes of association with this boat, and we'll tell that story, because uh, there wouldn't have been any second gun investigation without my partner, Joel Alcon, and uh, my audio uh, sound producer, Doug Moody, and Herb Cohn at the Frank Zappa organization, State Records. And there's a long history, and particularly an indebtedness 
to my great partner, the journalist filmmaker Gerard L. Kahn, and the wonderful dedicated researcher Lorraine Castellano. These are the real heroes of the RFK investigation and the depths and dimensions of the work that Dr. Cyril West gave to the Pope, Judge Robert Joey, Professor Herbert McDonald, Lowell Bradford, none the least William Harper, and William Bailey, who teaches at Rochester College in New Jersey. And, uh, well, and here we are. Springboards on, uh, on, on the extra boats that he saw and tears them all there to, to pieces for what he did in his book. Okay, and here, here we are with the journalist at the Frosty. And, and here we are, left with the aftermath of the uh, RFK killing. And after I make the song, Lockheed Killer on the Loose, a, a racist man kills five people just last week and himself in a Lockheed in, in Mississippi. I mean, here's another religious, violent, racist person uh, killing people in a Lockheed. I, I mean, I have to wonder, what happened to, uh, why aren't people, you know, Presley was missing a good lesson in evolution and, and people's uh, a lesson in stopping violence and not doing violence. I mean, what does this say for the people at Lockheed to hire a person and maintain a person who is such a racist? And then he comes in and blows away uh, some, some people, mostly black people, with a gun. I mean, this, this is, doesn't speak well for the people at Lockheed. Why don't they should come out? Well, I suppose what they know about Thane Gene Caesar. Well, I got to the personnel director, and that's when I found out they knew a lot more than they said, and they called him a gold brick. The guy that would do anything for a buck a very opportunistic and uh, they described uh, his racist views and how strong willed and opinionated he was. And he went to work uh, for George Wallace's party. Uh, he uh, was entitled to his political views, but no way in the world could a man like that have been part of the security details of all the tragedy and in that prime position and certainly all the guns should have been confiscated. So I just, I we don't know which gun killed Bobby Kennedy because they put a big cloud. There's so many guns. There's a mysterious gun, H1, 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 which the police allegedly destroyed. And then the gun was supposed to be available to the mafia and how I met the mafia characters. And that's another story we'll tell in, in the Hacker Report. What other, what other, it's, it's a weird story. One other important thing that I failed to mention was that, I mean, the, the scale of the number of people involved in the killing of RFK, I think, is quite large. And, and this is evidenced by the so-called woman in the polka dot dress that uh, ran out after the Kennedy killing, screaming, we got him, we got him, as if they'd won some sort of sporting event and they had scored a goal. Yeah, well, we goal. know Hank Hernandez did a number. He was a lieutenant. Hank Hernandez, the polygraph operator, he did a number in Sandy Serrano and I'm going to Eric at the Lockstock and Barrel Shop where Savannah and Confederates bought bullets and though they are not wanted to tell the truth, he was a sales clerk from the Lockstock and Barrel Shop and they impeached him on the witness stand and those tapes are in the California archives, the LAP archives and they were used in the television production by Tim Tate for England and they show how Sandy Serrano is coherent and uh, brainwashed to say that she didn't hear what she heard and see the, the polka dot dress girl and the others run from the scene. Well, what, now what and happens I, that? Well, I will tell you that uh, a lot of people are in for a big surprise, including Dan Maldea, when we break the startling news on the polka dot dress girl in the uh, termination queue. Robert Kennedy, uh, Jeff Hecker, uh, reports that Chirac saw in this uh, outstanding book report, uh, which I'm plugging today, but uh, which will reveal uh, phenomenal details of the polka dot dress girl and the proof positive that there was such a girl. Mm -hmm. so, that's coming. so you have evidence that the polka dot girl uh, exists and was a real person. Yes, contrary to what Dan Mulvaya says in his book and on his website. And we have a lot of surprises coming from Dan Mulvaya. Can, can you say what you have learned about this woman in the public address? Was she sort of uh, somebody's a female, <laughs> a, a trophy wife or something? Well, uh, she was, in my opinion, the handler of Sir Ed. He's interesting. Among the many witnesses I interviewed and recorded in 1916-69 for my uh, album, Who Really Killed Bobby Kennedy, 
It was Bickle Lubeck, and he knew that she had escaped through a China airline, San Francisco. Uh, and Fernando Fora, another uh, top notch investigative reporter on the Pentagon West Coast Trail, he had 19 witnesses back by by nineteen. He was a Hollywood citizen news reporter, uh, proving that there was a token of this, so he followed the story inch by inch and all the way to the top. They both knew the same story, and they had never met, and that shook me. So uh, that was the component, uh, that she was moving around with him. She was supposed to be the bad woman, allegedly, uh, from the Middle East, but was in the past of being an Arab with other uh, suspects. And who these suspects may or may not be all revealed in the RFK report. And this woman was a relatively attractive woman. Did she have yellow hair? Is this true? Or uh, No, that was a phony story. Because I interviewed Valerie Shelton. She was on a quest. The girl that they were described by George Green, Parker Griffin, and other witnesses to Fernando Fora and myself, uh, uh, was a swarthy girl, a dark conducted hair and had a large nose. And a girl, a dress that looked like polka dots was ruffled. But we'll tell you more about that, like in the book report. Okay, I'm going to end this portion of the interview after asking you this one question, uh, and we'll continue on with uh, it, yeah. with your permission uh, with these other questions on other famous assassinations. Uh, so after the killing of JFK, Martin Luther King, why weren't there 20 cameras and microphones, 15 robots, and a small unarmed army of humans to protect RFK? Is this idiocy on the part of the liberal humans? Well, the Warren Commission, whatever you think of it, and there are many detractors, never recommended security uh, personnel secret service for presidential candidates. Uh, later became part of congressional law, but by executive order, after the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president, ordered it. But the LAPD falsely said that Bobby Kennedy didn't want any security. It's not true. And our source is uh, John Kennedy's press secretary, Pierre Salinger, who was interviewed for RFK Productions and Cry for Justice, which was the production company formed 10 years ago uh, to find Caesar's son and to go on the air for two hour special. So you're talking the 21st century. Oh, yeah, this is true. This uh, was 1968. Yeah, and that was not a uh, secret camera. But ABC had an open microphone. Visual broadcasting company Andy West had his tape on. Our reporter Jeff Ben had his tape going. Little slapnicks. I'll reveal more about him. His film, he, he was afraid what happened in Dallas. He had gone to Dallas. The film disappeared. Uh, so he ran out of the kitchen bathroom. He never revealed that he was in there recording. Uh, as I say, his camera dropped. But I am one of the few persons in the world that heard his recording. And uh, yes, well, Michael yeah. Hecker, under the auspices of Judge Robert Schulman, they did acoustical sound analysis of the bullets. And there definitely is at least 10 shots. But we know from ABC XYZ, the count, that there were 12 shots. Five shots deliberately and intentionally from Sir Hans gun up front, and four shots uh, allegedly from Caesar from behind. That's the story, and uh, there's no other way to look at it. It seems obvious to me, especially in light of the Noguchi uh, autopsy report. I mean, it had to be Gene Caesar, but it's not obvious. Well, it was, there had to be a second gunman, yeah. uh, as William Castellano wrote in the famous article in the Los Angeles Times. I know in the Los Angeles Free Press, the alternative newspaper, but which I had the whole story on tape, which I brought to Washington, D.C., uh, and the original tapes in 1968, and then and again in 1968, before the Los Angeles Free Press, Castellano's story came out in the open. <coughs> I'm just correcting history, because Dan Aldea gets his facts wrong. There's a garden variety of deceptions fabrications, misrepresentations uh, uh, in the, in the post-assassination era. Yeah, people are play fast and furious with truth, and I think it's terrible. And with the facts. Yeah, and with the facts. So I, I, I uh, want to, to thank you for talking with me, and I'd like to continue, if, if you're interested in 
and uh, do a little bit more talking about some of these other uh, very interesting... Well, I must say that, you know, Bobby Kennedy said, uh, through exposure, like you're doing today, Ted, through the media, we must be equal and often ahead of our court system in protecting our fundamental rights. And we do need to advance the criminal justice system, like I've indicated by uh, inaugurating independent crime labs, and uh, we may never uh, get the truth in a court of law or in a congressional hearing, but these people must be held accountable to history, and that's how they will be exposed to the Internet through the DVDs that I'm releasing, uh, the VHS, who really killed Bobby Kennedy, the second gun, expose, uh, and and the new book report, which will be the definitive book report, and again, which is uh, information is available on our website, www.rmkseconddownexpose.com. So with your permission, I'd like to just take a short interval and then come back with you and well, talk with you some more. Well, all right. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I've been shutting my eyes because it's very humid in the air. Yeah. Uh, and my know. contact lens are uh, giving out on me. Uh, they're getting very watery uh, through light and humidity, and the fan's not going. But I've done the best I can in the difficult, difficult circumstances. And my voice is getting a little hoarse. Okay, so stay tuned for part two, and we're going to be going over some amazing information, including the killing of JFK and the cover-up of the JFK killing in Hendricks, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Elvis Presley, just to name a few people. So we'll be back in just a minute. Well, uh, I I think that uh, Ted doesn't want to talk about the killing of uh, John Lennon and uh, many of these other people because he he feels he's not really the professional. He doesn't know enough about it. And... uh, I think that's uh, that's fine. I, I really would like to bring this to this uh, to you people, and, and Ted says that I should make a video about this. And anything I say, of course, is only speculation. But uh, I think I'm going to do that and go through each of these killings because I think that the people in the USA should be aware that um, there's much more behind many of the killings of the uh, fine people and nonviolent leaders in the USA than they may be aware of. And uh, but for this interview, we've got quite a large amount of Of course, you can go with the researchers of the Martin Luther King uh, tragedy, uh, yeah. which is something. There's a whole exhibit of conspiracy music, and there's many books. Uh, and then you have the John Lennon uh, story, uh, that uh, terrible assassination. And you have the shooting of Ronald Reagan, the attempted shooting of Gerald Ford, and uh, the rock musician, Mysterious Death. I'm not saying, but there's a lot of people that speculate, uh, writers and researchers. Some have done a lot of research, and they put out books, or they put out storylines. University students have met with me over the years, and they've had the Barbara. They put out booklets on this. This thick one is Tony Dahl. There's all stories. Tony Dahl. Well, that's his name. Oh, I see. And he went on. Tony Dahl. I know Tory Dahl. Tony Dahl. He did a lot of research <laughs> with another student. Uh, and... Uh, it was uh, a thesis for them. And uh, at the symposiums, when they have the anniversary symposium, like they will in the 40s of JFK in Dallas, Texas, and at Dr. Cyril West's symposium in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, people will arrive with different viewpoints. Some are scholars, some are researchers, some are journalists, some are invited guests, some are just curiosity figures, they'll have their point of view. Now, you have certain strong viewpoints on life, on uh, social justice, on truth, yeah. and what I happened. I wanted to get your opinion about that. Um, well, that's why I invited you to. Violence in the USA, I mean, and, uh, you know, and sexuality and these other very controversial Well, let's look at it this way. Some towns are built to marble and some are built to steel. And some are built to steel. But only one to take you to you come here to Southern California, to Syracuse, New York, and New York, and my voice is flying up to catch a dream. A lot of people get caught in their ideas and their dreams, and they get torn apart by these ideas. And they tear their dreams apart. 
taking care of themselves the five kingdoms. There are a few others that need love, but they need the whole world as well. Well, I think so everybody they get on the platform. Them. They all need love. And they'll talk about unidentified flying saucers, religion, assassination, killing. But we all try to catch the dream. So beyond, beyond what lies beyond your world of dream. Well, I'm a total realist, and we live in a universe and in a star, well, I know a star system. More than just a world, we live in a star system. And we're going to be moving out to the moon of Earth and to Mars and to Alpha Centauri, the closest star. And I'd like to talk to you about that. And, I, and the, where is the science? We need a history of science. Yeah, yeah. well, one day you'll get to be. I think that, I think, the, I think that you, well, that's very good. And they've got then cover stories and commissions. And I think that uh, you spent your young years studying this and coming to strong viewpoints. And I think you should articulate this for your website. And get people definitely. To you know, and, my only uh, one constant video from 50 angles. I think you know. So, uh, and I come from a long line of uh, bastards named Ted. So that's a, that's another thing. And listen, I want to thank you now and and officially end this interview. Well, well I always uh, say. Go ahead. Right. Uh, it's, it's been my pleasure to do this interview and be here with you. If we uh, in this world are no strangers, only that's strange right. people. And you to meet. So, if we're related, we'll meet again and again. Probably on the web site. What's your website? TedHuntington.com. All right. Now you've got mine, RFKTitsRack.com and RFKSecondGunExpose.com and RFKSecondGunExpose.us. And maybe he's. And love and success. Rule the universe. Be with, you. Right? Be with us. Right. And here we are, all made out of light. We don't really go anywhere. The photons just travel through the universe. So uh, I like to think that uh, maybe our photons will bump into each other somewhere outside in, in a different galaxy, maybe Andromeda Galaxy or something. So thank you. Thank you yeah. very, very much. Ted Chirac. Ted Chirac. You remind me of the George Murray show that he heard in the adult show, and he has all these topics, you know. You'd be surprised what happens when you arrive at in Dallas. There's people that are saying Kennedy was killed by a flying saucer, oh, by, by agents of the Mossad. Unbelievably in Well, that, all these stories. So, you know, I, as I say, I've glanced, I've read some of the books. Vincent Bullios, he's coming up with this, what he thinks will be the end all of all books, taking on all the people that say this is going to John F. Kennedy. Well, Tom Bowden, the director of the Conspiracy Museum, he's going to be ready to take him on, put on his fist gloves, because he's been setting all this from every point of view as the director of the Con Conspiracy Museum for the last seven years. The church years. is green. You know? <laughs> and uh, and R.B. Cutler's work is pretty far out. R.B. Cutler's on an age, but he has his stories on the John F. Kennedy Foundation, but he put his money where his son is. He formed his own museum. Then to all have the committee to investigate assassination, which was the forerunner of the Assassination Archives and Research Center. Uh, you'll find these people show up. So, since you have a viable website and everything is happening on it, I think you should give your strong viewpoint. Yeah, well, this if I'm talking to someone and giving my personal viewpoints on life or my experience, that's fine. Uh, I can't tell my entire story. It's mind boggling, but I will tell. The story to the best of my ability uh, in the determination to RFK Jeff Hecker report, which is a spotlight on the Ted Chirac story and uh, my destiny uh, to be involved uh, as a, a key player in the Robert Kennedy tragedy and the post happening as a result of that uh, horrific assassination. Yeah. One of, this is one of the tragedies, uh, just as a, an aside, that uh, many people, the second that you say that uh, Gene Caesar killed uh, RFK, not Sirhan Sirhan, or that, uh, you know, Oswald didn't kill John Kennedy, that Frank Sturgis did, uh, then people are labeled insane, and the entire psychiatric apparatus is placed down on top of them. And this is a tragedy. And really, I think the key is, are they violent? I mean, they well, they want to kill the messengers, and... Uh, yeah. and uh, as you've indicated, some of the messages are speculative. Some are very valuable information. I can't begin to cite all the wonderful books on John F. Kennedy and the contributions they've made. 
and then there's documentaries, and CBS has done their situation. I'm sure that when the Vince and Bully Oti book comes out, it'll explode in the media because of who he is and his expertise. But the key researchers of the John F. Kennedy assassination, they'll take him on, and there'll be an open conflict. And I hope that when Jeff Hecker, the young writer that I inspired, comes out with my story, uh, well, like George Bush says, come on, I'll take them all on. But I'll be standing on ground that I'm sure of, that I know that I've lived, uh, and I've lived history in the R.F.K. assassination, and I'm proud of it, and I'm glad to make my contribution. One of the R.F.K. researchers is doing a film says, 100 years from now you'll be known as a second gun for what you accomplished, and uh, my friend Hal Jackson, my mentor, youth man that cut the story out of the world, he said, uh, it's incredible uh, to interact with just no one like you. If I was to choose of the top ten investigative reporters, and I, and I had a choice of ten, you'd be the first that I would ask to go on the time with me. Because I dug everything up on this RFK case from uh, soup to nuts, and will spill the beans <laughs> in, in the RFK uh, Hecker Report, named after a young uh, writer whom I've inspired and cooperated with and uh, co-wrote uh, the report. He sounds like a smart guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, and he, he's, he's steadfast, he stayed with it, and I've been the editor on it, and it's been a difficult story. And just like you at least have a website, so I think you have the ethical ob obligation to bring your viewpoint on whatever you want to say. Absolutely. Or, and I'd like to end this interview just by saying that uh, long live uh, peace, stopping violence, pleasure, truth, and justice. And Ted Chirac. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Teddy Kennedy said he didn't want to have life taken because Bobby Kennedy was a non-violent person. And he didn't believe in violent execution. So uh, this day, we will fight the Robert Kennedy case, I'm sure, and uh, Sir Han uh, deserves justice, but uh, he owes uh, a remorseful uh, reply to Teddy Kennedy, and Teddy Kennedy pleaded on behalf of the Kennedy family for Sir Han's life. Uh, Sir Han has not, uh, in my opinion, done the correct thing. If he wants public opinion on his side, he owes an apology to the Kennedy family, to the American people, for helping to franchise millions of voters, which would have probably been a Bobby Kennedy era. And instead, we have the legacy of the, of the Robert Kennedy assassination and the conspiracy and the cover up. And we'll move forward with strong and active faith. Uh, keep up the good work. Ted Hutchinson. Right! Huntington. Huntington. <laughs> we'll get the name right. Huntington. I like the Huntington Library. Mm -hmm. That's a good name. Yeah. Right. It's on the Declaration of Independence. So, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.